Well, good day, everyone. This is Chris with the Ancient Scholar. Hope you guys are all doing well. So today, what I thought I'd do is I I take a few slides. These are actually uh, pictures of histology samples that I took uh, about a month ago now, uh, when I was uh, uh, asked to do a heart and lung lab for the respiratory therapists, uh, respiratory therapy students. Uh, of course, I teach their uh, pharmacology in one of their labs and the part of the first year lab involves doing a um, heart and lung lab and I thought what I'd do is not only would we do the uh, the gross um, anatomy of the, the heart and lungs um, and you know we do some exercises uh, where we of course we, we do dissect the heart and we do appreciate the the, the structures of chordae tendineae, the papillary muscles, the myocardium look at the differences in walls and some, some of the vowels and so on uh, we also um, place the lungs on a ventilator and we, we show uh, how PEEP um, affects the lungs and how we can recruit alveoli and so on but I thought the other thing I do was I would supplement that lab by actually looking at the, some of the microscopic anatomy um, of the tissues involved in the major tissues involved in the respiratory uh, system, cardiorespiratory system, um, uh, specifically looking at you know some of the histology. So I was of course able to get into the physiology lab at the college and uh, make make some slides and uh, take some pictures, and they actually turned out really good. So I thought, why not go ahead and share these uh, with you guys as well, or at least some of them. So this is just an introduction to gross anatomy, physiology, and histology of the cardiorespiratory system, and this is a lab laboratory supplement. Okay, so the first uh, slide that we have here is a um, slide of cardiac muscle. And we'll talk about some of the defining characteristics of cardiac muscle. And you guys can see kind of the, the black um, arrow-shaped marker that's kind of built into the, the microscope itself, and that allows you to kind of pinpoint and mark things. Um, you can see that there's kind of a thinning of the cell there and kind of a line um, that that sort of seems like it might be separating one cell from another and you see that appear um, all over the place in this sample um, kind of this little line and this little line is a characteristic structure associated with the cardiac muscle histology um, let's go ahead and just take a look at uh, some of the uh, histological characteristics of the myocardial tissue. And it's called a myofibril. Uh, of course, this is where I have the actin and myosin. And I have um, actin and myosin, of course, uh, are involved in contraction of the muscle cell. And that's a majority of what we see, the myofibrils. Um, and the structure that I was alluding to earlier is something known as an intercalated disc. And the intercalated disc is a way that um, cells can communicate, if you will, and what they communicate is the action potential. We know that as these cells depolarize, um, depolarization ultimately causes a, a, a rush of potassium, or not potassium, a rush of calcium, excuse me, calcium in, um, and calcium is actually involved in opening the um, the uh, troponin binding sites on the actin and myosin and that allows the cell to contract. Um, well these intercalated discs are very important because they allow this action potential to propagate very quickly uh, through these cells otherwise uh, the depolarization would be very slow uh, contraction would you know then occur very slowly and it wouldn't be very coordinated um, so the intercalated discs are, are crucial to the cardiac uh, muscle, um, that we, to, basically to get that action potential uh, transmitted through this tissue very, very quickly and very efficiently. Um, here we have just the nucleus of the, the muscle cell. There, you can see the, the other cells have, have nucleuses in them. This is just a characteristic structure of many different types of uh, cells in our body, uh, with the exception of red blood cells, of course contains the, the DNA and of course these are being eukaryotic cells the nucleus is membrane bound um, and then we just have branching of the sh of the cells they branch here they branch there and you know we kind of like to see that and, you know again um, when these all contract you know I'm gonna have some coordinated um, contraction um, and ultimately you know this is going to result in either an atria or a ventricle contracting and pushing blood um, into another structure or out of the heart 
Okay, so now we're going to move on to the upper airway histology, and I'm actually really proud of the way that this uh, photograph uh, turned out. Uh, this is a cross-section of the upper airway. Uh, specifically, this is a tracheal cross-section. Um, the inner lumen of the airway is actually going to be right here on the left, and that's actually where um, I have um, gas moving in and out. This is part of the, the conducting um, airway network. Um, so that's where the inner lumen of the airway would be, and of course the outer lumen would be um, somewhere on the right. Okay, so the first cells that we run into are the pseudostratified ciliated uh, columnar epithelial cells. You can see them there. They, they're kind of a little hairy structure, and um, of course these cells are involved in um, the mucociliary escalator, the mucociliary transport mechanism. They have um, lots of cilia on them. The cilia beat very rapidly, and the cilia, of course, what propel the mucus layer up and out of um, the airway. And the mucus layer, of course, is very uh, important in trapping toxins and, and dust and, and potential pathogens. And then, of course, these little cilia can beat uh, very rapidly and hopefully get that mucus um, out of the airways. Okay. Um, just underneath the uh, pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelial tissue, we have the, the seromucous glands in the what's known as a submucosal layer. It's below the mucosal uh, lining or the mucosa, and um, these glands are involved in secreting the mucus. They secrete, of course, mucus is very complicated, has very diff many different components, and we have all these different glands um, that are secreting those components and of course we know that the um, airways are highly innervated by the parasympathetic nervous system and it is parasympathetic innervation activation that uh, really does cause most of the uh, mucus uh, per, uh, secretion uh, to occur in the airways. Okay, we have just a little blood vessel there, kind of, kind of large. Um, you can see that it has different layers and we would expect that of a blood vessel. Um, going deeper now, um, below the, uh, the uh, submucosal layer, um, we actually have a very thick layer of what's known as hyaline cartilage. And hyaline cartilage is, is characteristic of what are known as our cartilaginous airways, and these are the first several generations of our airway. Um, so when we talk about bronchospasm, for example, we wouldn't really see bronchospasm in the upper airways, um, simply because they have such a very large, thick layer of hyaline cartilage that um, the spasm is not going to be a much, as much of a concern as when I get into the lower airways and I have less cartilage and more uh, smooth muscle. Um, however, inflammation and mucus production can always uh, be a problem in the upper airways. And then we just have a smooth, uh, smooth muscle layer uh, underneath the hyaline cartilage there. Um, and of course, I do have a certain amount of smooth muscle even in my upper airways. Okay, so that's the basic histology of the upper airway. Uh, we'll move on to some lower airway histology. Um, and the first thing we have is an alveoli. And uh, some of the, the words have been cut off a little bit. Um, when I ported this presentation over to PowerPoint from, from Keynote, there were some kind of some um, interesting errors that have occurred. And unfortunately, Apple um, and all their, their wisdom have, really haven't they haven't really got, they're just not compatible with other other systems, and it is a little frustrating as a Mac user um, when I convert things over to PowerPoint. Well, be that as it may, um, we have the alveoli, and of course we know the alveoli. There, there are literally millions and billions, millions and millions of alveoli in our lungs, and they, um, um, of course, take up almost the, uh, the surface area of a, of a tennis court, and they allow for gas exchange, and of course I have two types of of uh, cell types, you really can't appreciate that here on, on this on this slide, and the, the magnification isn't enough. But you, you have your type one alveolar pneumocytes, which, come, which are mainly what you can see here, and they make up main, make up the main structure of the alveoli. Whereas your type two alveolar pneumocytes, um, of course, secrete surfactant, and you also have alveolar macrophage. But you really can't appreciate those in this picture here. Um, also have an alveolar duct. Uh, you know this is where respiratory bronchial kind of ends, and I have uh, ducts, and I have groups of alveoli, kind of uh, like grape-like structures, kind of branching off of this duct here. Um, then I have uh, a bronchial. Again, uh, <laughs> we kind of got cut off there. I have a, I have a bronchial. So this is um, 
uh, before we get to the respiratory bronchioles. Um, you can see, if you look really closely, you can see some, some, some pseudostratified columnar epithelial tissue there. Um, of course, we don't have that, that uh, pseudostratified col uh, columnar epithelial structure in the alveoli themselves, however. So you can really appreciate the, the stark contrast be between the bronchial and um, within the alveoli. Okay, and uh, here I just have uh, this, uh, basically a group of alveoli, and, and, and again, you know, it kind of cut off the, uh, the, the proper names, and I do apologize for that, um, so uh, if you get really upset, uh, call Apple and, and tell them that they, they need to make their products a little bit more compatible with things like PowerPoint, I would greatly appreciate that. And uh, moving on, now we just want to, I want to go ahead and, and um, contrast uh, what we just saw to a tissue sample of uh, somebody with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, specifically emphysema. Um, when you look here, you can see that the, the, the structure of the alveoli is pretty much lost. I just have these, these just large, massive pockets. Um, you know, the, the alveoli are destroyed. Lose all that structure, and of course that decreases the surface area, and that na naturally will impair gas exchange, and it can lead to um, uh, trapping of air in the lungs. And obviously, I can get things like mucus uh, trapped in there as well. And you know, I don't really have an effective way of getting that mucus out. And you can just see just how different um, the histology looks compared to the, the normal tissue on the last slide. And what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and compare and contrast those together. So you can see I have a lot on the left there, I have a normal uh, slide of a normal lung parenchyma. And you have lots of alveoli, lots of surface area. And we contrast that to the one on the right. And I've lost, I've lost the alveoli structure. Uh, primary structure has been lost for the most part. And I just have this large open areas um, where gas is coming in and can get trapped in there and of course I just don't have all that surface area. I don't have the ability to effectively exchange gas in this case.